Good to be back after all the roamings I did during the summer. While you're enjoying the heat, I enjoyed the cool. <laughs> Our study today, as you can see, is the everlasting gospel. It's based on Revelation 14 and Matthew 24, 14. This is the incredible good news of salvation. I believe, folks, that God raised the Advent movement to proclaim this message in his global mission. He did not raise us up to rehash the Armenian gospel, which is good advice rather than good news. That is why you notice in our scripture reading, that Judy read, that when this gospel is preached, the hour of judgment has come. It is not referring to the investigative judgment. This gospel is such incredible good news that it will become inexcusable for you to be lost when you hear this message and are convicted by the Holy Spirit. That is why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, that this message of the kingdom will be preached before the end can come. Okay, now, the phrase, the everlasting gospel, is unique to Revelation 14. Not only the first angel, all three angels are pre presenting the everlasting gospel. The word followed is not the best translation. The other two angels join the first angel in preaching this incredible good news. It is based on the fact that the gospel was planned by God before creation of the human race. So I've got some text which I would like you to look at. Please turn, first of all, to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. I'll start with verse 3 to get the context. This is what Paul wrote to this discouraged church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, please notice the past tense, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, that is the Father, chose us human beings in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Do you realize that in Christ we are holy and without blame? I know you will say, I don't feel it. Forget your feelings. Look at what God says, okay? Then turn to 2 Timothy. This is the last letter Paul ever penned before he was executed as a martyr for Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1. He's passing the mantle of the preaching of the gospel to Timothy. And in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, look at what he says in verse 8 to 10. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be afraid to be called a Christian. Nor of me, his prison, prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has, again past tense, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Folks, holy living doesn't save us. It's the evidence. It's the fruits of salvation. Not according to our works. We are not saved according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. When was it given to us? Before time. In other words, from everlasting. But the reality is in verse 10. But has now been revealed become a fact by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has number one abolished death this is not referring to the sleep death because we you know we died the sleep death but to the eternal second death he has abolished it and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel and then Paul adds to which I was appointed a preacher an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles okay now in the Old Testament, the everlasting gospel is identified with the everlasting covenant. And now you notice I put in bracket two Greek words. Sunteke and diateke. The Bible never used sunteke when it discusses the gospel. Sunteke is what most people think of as a covenant. An agreement between two parties. It's a contract between two people. That is never used in the New Testament or the Old Testament or Greek Old Testament for the gospel. 
Diatheke is a promise that God made benefiting the human race. Paul e equates the diatheke with a will. You know, when you make a will, that will is a promise. But that will does not become effective until the one who makes the will dies. And Paul says in Galatians, the moment Christ died, that will became a reality. Before that, it was a promise. But now it is a reality. So stop looking miserable, folks. This is good news. Okay, now, let me give you some text where it talks about the everlasting covenant in the Old Testament. First of all, turn to Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. And listen to what Moses penned here. Chapter 9, verse 16. Genesis chapter 9, and look at verse 16. You got it? Here it is. This is God talking through Noah. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So this is a promise that God made. Then go to chapter 17 of the same book, Genesis 17, and listen to what is penned there in verse 5 to 7. Genesis 17, 5 to 7. Very interesting statement here. This is talking to Abraham, or he was Abram first. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many what? Not just Jews. You know, Abraham is a father physically of the Jews, but spiritually he is the father of all those who have the faith of Abraham. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So that, folks, is what the everlasting covenant is all about. But I want to give you one more text. Exodus 31. It's an amazing statement. Now, in my King James, it doesn't use the word everlasting, but in the original, that's what the word is used. Chapter 31 of Exodus, look at verse 16. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the what? Sabbath. To observe the Sabbath throughout their generation as a what? The Hebrew says everlasting covenant. You know, folks, the reason why our Sabbath preaching has not made too much an impact on the Christian church is because we are emphasizing the fourth commandment. Most Christians believe that the law was done away with, was nailed on the cross. So the moment we preach the fourth commandment, the Sabbath in the fourth commandment, it's like pouring water on a duck's back. It just drips off. Folks, God gave the Sabbath a redemptive application. You know, my roommate uh, in Newbold was Samuel Bakioki. Some of you know who he was. <laughs> Uh, I lasted with him only one quarter. He never sleeps, you know. <laughs> Wake me up at three in the morning and said, Jack, I said, Sam, it is three in the morning. <laughs> but his dissertation was to prove that it was the Catholic Church that actually changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And the Catholic Church has been accusing the Protestants, if you are keeping Sunday, which is not mentioned in the Bible as the Sabbath, then you must admit that the Catholic Church had that authority. <laughs> and so Samuel Bacchiocchi did his dissertation there in Gregorian University in, London, in Rome. And you know what? Seven Sunday-keeping scholars published a book to defend Sunday-keeping against Bacchiocchi's dissertation. But it's amazing. You know, when you read that book, you know, it's a, edited by Carlson. The, these seven scholars admit that the Gentiles of the New Testament times kept the Sabbath because there's not a single ripple that they were not keeping it. Otherwise, the Judaizers would have, besides circumcision, forced them to keep the right Sabbath. 
They admit that Sabbath has a redemptive application. They even admit that we should never call Sunday a Sabbath because in the original, it mostly uses the Sabbath, which is a specific day, and they admit it's sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. We should call Sunday the Lord's Day. And when I mix with my non-Adventist pastors, I ask them one question. When was our salvation fulfilled? When did Christ cry out, it is finished? Sunday or Friday night? And they admit, I said, you know, the resurrection did not add to our salvation. It simply confirmed what Christ did in his life and death. And they have a hard time. They say, Excuse me, you are not preaching an Adventist message. Well, I'm preaching from the Bible. Okay, let's go on. Let us consider this everlasting gospel as it was fulfilled in reality in Christ some 2,000 years ago. I want to take you through this incredible good news. It is the incredible good news of salvation obtained for the entire human race as God's supreme gift to mankind. This is a message that will force every human being who reaches the age of accountability to make a decision either for Christ or against Christ before the end can come. Okay, we, to understand this gospel, we need to understand our situation in Adam. Okay? The human race is the extension of Adam's life after he sinned. Please turn to Acts 17. Listen to what Luke penned here. Acts chapter 17. And I want you to notice a very important statement made by the, the physician... Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. Now, different translations have different words. The New King James, which I'm using, has the original word, meaning of the word, but the others are not wrong. Some say the word source, some say one man, but listen to what Luke actually wrote. Chapter 16, verse 26. Chapter 16. No, sorry, 17, rather, of, and verse 26. And he, that is God, has made from one blood. You see, the word blood means life. From one life, every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth. So it doesn't matter where you come from. We are all an extension or multiplication of Adam's life after his sin. So God doesn't create a brand new life every time a baby is conceived. That would make God a creator of sin, because babies are born sinners. We are all an extension of multiple item life after his sin. And that's what Luke says. Therefore, it is a life that, and I'm giving you several statements, was sold to Satan. In Luke 4, verse 5 and 6, Satan claimed in the second temptation of Christ, this world was given to him. And Jesus did not oppose that because on more than one occasion, Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of the Lord of this world. So one of the reasons he came to this world is to buy us back. That's what the word redemption means. Number two, this life was condemned to death because God said to Adam, the day you sin, you shall surely die. And because we are an extension of that life, that sin, Romans 5, the first part of 18, says that by one man's disobedience, condemnation came to all mankind. Number three, this life became a slave to sin and the devil. So you and I were born slaves, you know. I've, there are many texts, but I'm giving you one from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Listen to what, you know, Jesus said to these Jews, you know, who claim to be perfect especially the Pharisees. John chapter 8, verse 31. Listen to what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. There were other Jews also who did not believe in him. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And then, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, I have a very close Adventist pastor. We have got good friends. And he held an evangelistic effort in a very big city in California. And for the first two weeks, he preached nothing but the good news of the gospel. And his head elder came up to me and said, when are you going to preach the truth? And the 
Pastor, where have you been these last two weeks? No, no, I don't mean. Everybody knows that. To him, the truth was the distinct doctrine of the Adventist church. Folks, the gospel is still the truth today. Well, the Jews answered, because Jesus said in verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, we are God's chosen people, and have never been in bondage to anyone, which is a lie, they were under Roman bondage. How can you say you will be made free? Now please notice the reply Jesus gave. Jesus answered them, most assuredly, which is in modern English, I guarantee you, whoever commits sin is what? A slave to sin. You know, a slave has no freedom. He's a slave to sin. You know, when the King James was translated in 1611, the translators in most of the passages which use the word slave, they, trans they, they translated it to the word servant. There's a world of difference between a servant and a slave. The reason they did that because England was practicing slavery in the 1611. So they prefer to use the word servant. And guess what? Our good farmers in the south who practice slavery like that word servant. But Paul say, Jesus said, and Paul also says that, that we are slaves to sin. We have no freedom, folks. We are born slaves. Okay, let's go on and see what else we have to learn. Number four. When Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit left him. He died spiritually since the Holy Spirit left him. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 1 that we are dead in trespasses, which means we are dead spiritually. We are born dead spiritually. Yeah, we have physical life, but spiritually we are dead. That is the fourth thing that happened when Adam sinned. Now there is a fifth one that is a heresy. And that's the heresy of original sin. And that heresy is that we are born guilty of Adam's sin. Now, guilt involves volition. It involves responsibility. God never holds us responsible for Adam's sin. But because the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church and others believe that we are also born guilty of Adam's sin, they introduce infant baptism to remove that guilt. But nowhere in the Bible does it ever mention that we are guilty of Adam's sin. But these four we can defend from Scripture that has passed on to mankind, including from Ellen G. White. Therefore, we were all born with a life that, has, that was spiritually dead, a slave to sin, sold to Satan, and condemned to death. That is our inheritance. And there's nothing we can do about it. The Greek word for this ruined life is bios. Now, here's a problem. There are two words in the Greek that are translated in your Bible with the word life. One of them is bios. I've given you only two examples. Luke 8, 14, where Jesus is describing the parable of the sower that fell on the thorns. On thorns and the, he says, those who fall on thorns, their life is choked out by the cares of this world and the desires of this life. And that word life is bios. First John, I want you to look at this one. First John, chapter 2. Because that is what we are struggling with because you see, our nature doesn't change after you accept Christ, unfortunately. Our natures will change when Christ comes the second time, when this corruption puts on incorruption. But First John chapter 2, look at verse 15 and 16. Listen to what this writer wrote. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does it mean by the world? Here it is, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that word life is bios. For which, by the way, we have the English word biography. So folks, that is the life you and I were born with. That is not the life that God breathed into Adam. When you look at Genesis 2-7, which is in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the life that God breathed into Adam is the same as his own life, God's own life. Mankind therefore needs a savior. Jesus Christ, folks, is the savior. His salvation is the central theme of Paul's theology. That's what he was called by God, to proclaim the gospel. 
He is the only theologian of the New Testament. The others are wonderful preachers, but they don't go deep enough as Paul did. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the last two verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 and 31. Here's one of Paul's statements. But of him, that is the father, you, and by the way, you is in the plural, so the human race, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. And that word wisdom in the Greek is Sophia. You know, Jean and I were in Istanbul in August, and there's a beautiful cathedral built by the Christian church in the 11th century. It is now turned into a mosque with four minarets. The church had lost its saltiness. All the churches we visited in Turkey, established by Paul, are in ruins. And when a church loses its saltiness, it is trampled by men. So, by, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom, special knowledge from God. What is that wisdom? Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All that is ours in Christ. Then verse 31. And as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in who? In the Lord. You know that word glory is much stronger than the English word. So let me give you an illustration. When we were in the mission field in Kenya, next door to our house was another missionary family. You know, they had three boys. The youngest, you know, maybe five, six, when he smelled Jean cookie, making cookies, he smelled the cooking, and he came to the house and he said to Jean, can I have one cookie? And she gave him a cookie. And he thanked us and he ate it, and then he said to Jean, I have two brothers. <laughs> so she gave him two more cookies. What he did not realize, but we were watching him as he went around the house. Guess what he did with the cookies? Wasn't he wonderful eating those two cookies on behalf of his two brothers? <laughs> so when we, we came to the States in 82, we stayed in, with the family there in Modesto. His, his, their, their father was teaching their, their school there. He was now a young man studying medicine in Loma Linda. And he came out, asked to play with him as a kid. So he came up to me and said, I want you to come and see my new toy. I said, really, what's that? Come and see, he said. So we went to the back of his house and guess what his new toy was. It was a Ferrari. You know how expensive those cars are? I said, how on earth could you afford a Ferrari when you're studying at Loma Linda, which is extremely expensive? And he said, I did not pay much money. It was a wreck. I bought it from a junkyard. But I fixed it and I even painted it. And no, it looked brand new. It was so shiny, the paint was so shiny, I put my hand to touch it, and he yelled at me, don't touch it, he said. I thought the paint was wet. It wasn't wet. He did not want my fingerprints to be on his car. But I already touched it, so he pulled out his handkerchief, and he, he was glorying in his Ferrari. And Paul tells us in Galatians six fourteen. God forbid that I should glory in anything else but the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why I really appreciated the special music that was sung. So, Paul is saying, let's glory on the cross because that's where we were redeemed. Okay, the Greek word for the everlasting, eternal divine life of Christ that saved us is zoe. And I've given you two texts. When you read these two texts, you'll notice the word life in your English Bible in the Greek is Zoe. This is the kind of life that God breathed into Adam. This is also the same Zoe life God breathed into Adam at creation. This is the Genesis 2-7 in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Now please notice, Adam was created in the image of God. His life that he received from God was dominated by agape love that has no self in it. And you need to understand it because when Eve brought that forbidden fruit to Adam. Did he know it was the forbidden fruit? Yes or no? Yes. Could he save Eve by eating it? No. Did he know by eating it he would die? Yes. So why did he do such a foolish thing? 
I'll tell you why. He loved Eve more than himself. Because his nature was like that. And he said, Eve, I will die with you. And I'm, I'm sure she said, oh, what a wonderful husband. But the moment he ate, his nature changed. I like the way Steps to Christ puts it in page 17. Love disappeared and selfishness took its place. And so when God came to see him that evening, he didn't deny what he did. But he said, God, don't blame me. It's this defective wife that you created for me. She is responsible for it. And he said, don't blame me. That serpent that you created that could talk. So since then, we blame everybody else for our mistakes. Sometimes we even say, the devil made me do it. No, folks, the devil did not make you. He doesn't need to. Your nature made you do it. So that's our problem. Unfortunately, both the words, bios and zoe, are translated in our English Bibles by the word life. So you can't tell the difference. Therefore, it is very difficult to distinguish between man's cooperate or collective sinful bios life and the sinless eternal divine life of Zoe of, of Christ. Now I want to take, this is not the 12 steps, you know, for recovery from alcohol. This is a 12 steps recovery from the sin problem, the universal sin problem. Number one, in order for Christ to be mankind's savior, he had to surrender his Zoe life to the Father. You know, Philippians 2 verse 5 to 7 says, he was equal with God, but he emptied himself. That word empty is kenosis. He gave up the independent use of his divine life. He said, Father, you can control my life. That's the first step. The second step for the Father to legally qualify Christ to be the savior of the mankind, he had to unite the divine Zoe life of Christ to mankind's corporate bias life that needed redeeming. Now, I want to notice, I want you to notice that the word legally is italized. Here's the reason. You know, 70% of the world population is non-Christian. The largest of the non-Christian religions is Islam, the fastest growing religion and the largest religion in the world today. Their imams accuse Christianity of legal fiction. And maybe in my next sermon I'll explain that in more detail. But here's the reason. And they were right. Deuteronomy, there are many texts. Deuteronomy 24... And look at verse 16. This is the book of the law. This is a legal code that God gave the Jews in the Torah. Chapter 24, verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own what? Sin. In other words, you can't transfer Guilt and punishment from a guilty person to an innocent person. But as the, the Christian church teaches that Christ, an innocent man, died for the guilty. And they say that's legal fiction. And they, they, they could go use many texts in the Bible. Uh, let me give you another one. Ezekiel 18 is another good one. Ezekiel 18. And the first 20 verses, Ezekiel the prophet is dealing with this issue. I will only read the conclusion. Verse 20. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. And I like the way Ezekiel put it. The soul who sins shall die. So souls can die, folks. The soul that sins will, shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You cannot transfer these two things. You can't transfer guilt from a guilty person to an innocent person. So this has created a major problem. And unless the Christian church solves this problem, we will not be able to touch 70% of the world population. This was accomplished, the, the, the union of divine and human life was accomplished by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. Remember what the angel said to Mary? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and this will take place. Okay, now, in the incarnation, Jesus became the God-man. The Zoe life and the bias life were united in one person, Jesus Christ. You know, the Christian church had a hard time with this. They argued for over 300 years 
How can one man be both God and man? Finally, the Council of Nicaea, about 321 AD, they agreed. He was both. You think that solved the problem? No. A new problem came up. How much of him was God and how much of him was man? Was it 50-50? And they argued for another 100 years. And then in the Council of Chalcedon, they admitted he was 100% God and 100% man in one person. They said, we can't explain this. This is a mystery. The Bible teaches we accept it. It took them over 400 years to accept the truth. But here is what the Bible says. And the word, which is God, Christ, referring to Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, number four. In the incarnation, the Holy Spirit was renewed to the human race in Christ. See, when Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit left him. His life was plunged into darkness. So you were born and I was born without the Holy Spirit. But Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 2 verse 5 that when Christ and we were united in the womb of Mary, we were made spiritual alive. But I would like you to look at Titus. Titus chapter 3. It's a little book. Titus 3. A little book before Hebrews, in fact, before Philemon, which is also a little book. But look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. This is what Paul wrote to this Gentile co-workers. Not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So if, because of this, we can experience the new birth. This is what the Bible says. Okay, number five. The union between Christ's divine Zoe life and humanity's corporate bias life resulted in Christ becoming the second or last Adam. The word Adam in Hebrew means mankind. If you want a good text, Genesis 5, 1 and 2. But 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul refers to Christ as the last Adam. So there's only two Adams. The last Adam is also the second Adam. There's no three, third Adam. They both represent the human race. The first Adam ruined us, the last Adam redeemed us. Number six, our legal substitute, as our legal substitute, Christ had to first perfectly obey the law on man's behalf. Because the Bible says obey and what? Live. From birth to manhood, and manhood in the Bible is 30 years old. In our country it's 18, but in the Bible it's 30 years old. From birth to 30 years old, Christ kept the law perfectly in thought, word, and deed. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. He kept the law perfectly. You know, in John 3, you know verse 16, but in verse 17, we read, God sent his son not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And in John 17, verse 4, as he approaches the cross, Jesus praying to his father, said, I have glorified your name and I have finished the work you gave me to do. And on the cross, John 19, 30, he cried out, it is finished. But this perfect obedience could not cancel our sins. Our sins were canceled on the cross. Galatians 3, verse 10 to 13. We were redeemed from the curse of the law and Christ himself was made a curse for us. Number eight, on the cross, our corporate, now this is something you need to know, our corporate bios life died in Christ. Not for three days, but for eternity, the second death. You know, one of the big problems I face with my fellow scholars, you know, my fellow Christians, how could I be in Christ 2,000 years ago before I was born? They forget to realize that the bios life existed, that they were born with, existed 2,000 years ago. So when Christ died on the cross, because the wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, do you know you and I died? So I want you to look at 2 Corinthians so that you get this from the Bible, not from my lips. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Listen to what Paul penned here. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge. And the Greek word is convinces us. 
that if one died for all, what's the next statement? Then all died. Folks, we died in Christ before we were born. I know that makes no sense to us. But it's biblical, so you better accept it. Okay, number nine. In exchange, because our life died eternally, in exchange, the Father gave the Zoe life of his Son to the human race in Christ. That's God's gift to mankind. That's why in 2 Timothy verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8 to 11, which we read already, we are told that God has given us eternal life, immortality. But I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5, which brings it out so clearly. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 11. Verse 11 is addressing believers. Verse 12 is addressing non-believers. And this is the testimony, this is the record, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. Do you know what word is used there in the original? Not bias, but zoe. Now look at verse 12. He who has the son, that is the believer, has zoe. He who does not have the son of God does not have zoe. Still has bios, which stands condemned to death. So that's number nine. Now let's go to number ten. There, in the resurrection, Christ and the human race shared the same eternal zoe life. Hebrews 2.11 says, he who sanctifies us and we who are sanctified are all of one. That is why this is on this fact that we have the doctrine of adoption. Do you know we have been adopted in the family of God? Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. There are three words that are repeated three times. There's a word repeated three times together in the King James. The other translation had the word with. We were made alive together with Christ. We were raised from the dead after his, we were saved by grace. We were raised together with Christ. And we are presently, present tense, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is our destiny. That is our citizenship. All we are doing is waiting for that great event. Okay, objectively, when I use the word, I have mentioned this before, but let me repeat it. The Bible has two dimensions of salvation. Objectively is dealing with the gospel that Christ obtained from all of mankind in his birth, life, death, and resurrection. That's objective. 2,000 years ago. In Romans 5, 18, by one man's obedience, justification unto life came to all mankind. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says, we were made alive together with Christ, we were saved in Christ, and we were resurrected in Christ, and we are sitting in heavenly places. Jesus and mankind share the same Zoe life. That, folks, is the incredible good news. This is the gospel that makes it inexcusable for anyone to be lost. This is the incredible good news that God raised the Advent moment to proclaim the world. God never raised us up, folks, to rehash the Armenian gospel, which is good advice and not good news. My dear people, this gospel needs to be restored. Subjectively, experientially, it is experienced individually through by faith in Christ and him crucified. Because that gift is, for, is a gift. That salvation is a gift. This is what righteousness by faith is all about. The everlasting gospel of the three angels' message of Re Revelation 14. John 3.16, John 5.24, Jesus said, the moment you believe in him, you have already passed from death to life. And Romans 1.16 to 17, which is the introduction to the gospel, Paul says that this gospel is good news, where the moment you accept it, you passed from condemnation to justification. Okay, what do we say to all this in 2 Corinthians 9.15? Thanks be to God for his what? indescribable gift. So stop looking miserable, folks. We are sitting in heavenly places in Christ. This is the incredible good news. And when the world hears this message and the Holy Spirit convicts the world, it will become inexcusable for anyone to be lost. They would have to deliberately choose to be lost. Then the end can come. And it is my prayer, folks, that we will restore this gospel. Now thank God it is being restored. I thank God the light bearers are restoring it. And there are others, younger pastors who are restoring it. I thank God Carl Kozat, 
who is the professor of theology at Walla Walla, is restoring it. So, you know, God is moving in the right direction. And I hope it will be soon when this earth will be lightened with the glory of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you that you spared not your own son. You delivered him to the cross so that by his life and death, he could rewrite our history and change our legal status from condemnation to justification unto life. Lord, the world desperately needs this message because things are not looking very good to the world. Crime is increasing, wars are increasing, and the future looks bleak. But thank you for giving us the gift of salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. First of all, Lord, let us personally rejoice in this message and then use us to turn this world upside down with this message. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.